It's time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good afternoon on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Hope that you're uh, practicing social distancing and getting outside, uh, catching up in the yard work, or just out uh, walking the trails that are still open. Anything outside today is a plus, and it's a benefit. So we're glad to have you listening on the Kim Hammer Show today here on 101.1 FM, The Answer, or watching us on Facebook Live. If you have a question you'd like to send in, go up to the video comment section, and you can uh, send in a question. And Ben over here, of which we're over six feet apart, by the way, uh, Ben over here will be glad to get that question, and we'll get it either to Congressman Walmack for the first half of the hour or to Cody Wake, who is the uh, Director of Office of Skills Development Division, part of the Department of Commerce. He's going to be on the second half. Real quick, let me get to the sponsors that make this show possible. We're very appreciative, always, for Everett Buick GMC uh, down there in I-30 and Elko Road. But the good thing is you can shop them online as well. So go up there to their website. They'll be glad to help you. There are some incredible deals right now. If you're in the market for a new car, there are just absolutely some incredible deals that you can take advantage of during this time. And I would encourage you to go by, and you can uh, look at their new cars, or you can look at their uh, uh, pre-owned cars that still carry with them uh, warranties. And so I would just encourage you to go down and take a look at Everett Buick GMC, I-30, down there at Alcoa Exit in Saline County. Then also Baxley, Penfield, Mowdy. As I always tell you, they are great realtors that take care of all your needs, whether it's uh, for commercial, residential, for rental, and that is for commercial and residential as well. They can take care of all of your needs. Give them a call down there at Baxley, Penfield, Mounty. Uh, they're located at Spring Hill Road and uh, Highway 5, and they will be glad to take care of you. And then, of course, Edwards Food Store, located here in central Arkansas, over there in eastern Arkansas as well. Uh, I was in there again. It's my Saturday morning ritual. I was in there this morning. And uh, believe it or not, I bet they had probably about 60, 70 packages of uh, toilet paper and other paper goods and so uh, we're kind of catching up on the on the food chain supply here uh, but a great place to go because you always get good competitive prices and you'll also get it in a clean store you can order online they'll bring it out there to you you don't even have to go in the store if you don't want to and they're being very conscientious as far as uh, the covid virus and making sure everything stays sanitized and clean one other plug we have our website up and going it is if you want to if you want to go up look at my website and I keep some really current information some things coming out of uh, uh, the Congress offices and the Senate offices as well as things around here in the state uh, it's a pretty informative website it's to find it you go the kimhammershow.com and you got to put the word the in front of the Kim Hammer the kimhammershow.com and you can pull it up and uh, it's got a lot of neat stuff on it it also has a lot of informative stuff factual stuff I try to do a really good job to make sure it's not fake news or somebody sucker punching me, uh, but it's a good source to go to. All right. With that being said, we're really uh, blessed today to have joining us uh, over the phone Steve Walmack, Congressman Steve Walmack, who represents the 3rd District here in the state of Arkansas. And Steve, welcome uh, to the Kim Hammer Show, and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Kim, it's an honor to be with you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the good people in Arkansas, down in central Arkansas, particularly in Saline County. You know, I, my, one of my fondest memories in high school, September 1974, I was a wide receiver on the Russellville Cyclone football team, and our tailback got hurt the week that we were to open the season against the Benton Panthers. <clears throat> and they moved me to running back, and... And and not to brag, uh, because they say if it's the truth, you're not you're not bragging. But that night, the first two times I touched the football as a running back, I scored touchdowns against Benton, and we beat them twenty to twelve. Now I would like to say it's because I was this great athlete, but it, it, it that would be very misleading. The reason I was able to score two touchdowns on one of them, you had an All American down there by the name of Dale White. I don't know if you remember that name. But he was an All-American at the University of Arkansas, uh, but he was a stud for Benton. And um, on one of those plays, he blitzed our quarterback when he handed the ball off to me, and there was nobody in the gap 
because Dale had the quarterback uh, and was about to be very rude to him. And I ran to uh, an open daylight and, and was able to go 56 yards for a touchdown. But I, So anytime I think about Benton, Arkansas, I think about that night because I was scared to death of this Dale White guy hitting me uh, as he did many, many people. But fond, fond memories of Benton, Arkansas. Well, it's been great to have you on the radio. See you later after that. You kind of rubbed it in her face down here. But, hey, you met my daughter uh, about a month ago. She was up in D.C. with the Boys and Girls Club and came by your office. And uh, appreciate the way that you were um, uh, very cordial to her and the whole group that was there. Left a good impression. And she told me you would probably tell the Dale White story. And uh, I know that that uh, that's the good thing about playing sports is it will leave a good memory. You got to deal with the bad ones, but it will leave a good memory, too, that kind of give you some life lessons moving on. Sure did. Sure did. You know, you know how we used to judge back in those days whether uh, a guy was a real <clears throat> stud or not on the football field. Uh, and by the way, our entire locker room was papered with all kinds of Dale White stories just to kind of get us pumped up. But the way I was able to determine the guy was somebody you didn't want to mess with was he had facial hair. And, um, and, and by golly, anytime you ran into somebody with facial hair, you knew Boy, this this, this is a this is a rough hombre. But he was a great player. Max Graham was the coach. Mm-hmm. I later went to college with his daughter Ladonna, and uh, but Benton was a very very good football team, and we just got real lucky that night to be able to beat them by eight points and uh, and move on through our season. But anyway, enough of that nonsense. Well, you've got some good fond memories of Central Arkansas, and that's the one thing you know trying to do on the Kim Hammer Show is to uh, make this a statewide show, and that's why I wanted to reach out to. You. In fact, uh, we are actually going to do some remote shows, and uh, one area we want to come up to is in Northwest Arkansas. So when we come that way, uh, hopefully we can have you on the show then after all this COVID nineteen stuff settles down, uh, and try to oh, make absolutely. this a you know make this a statewide show where everybody feels. Uh, feels the part and every Arkansan is made to feel important. That's what we're all about. Well, you've got an you got an open invitation anytime you want to come to Northwest Arkansas. I was a mayor up here for 12 years in Rogers when we did all this economic development stuff between 1999 and 2010. And uh, I'm very proud of the work that we did. And uh, Northwest Arkansas is a very blessed area right now. Well, we are a diverse state and uh, we've got a little bit of everything, which makes it a great place to live. But Speaking of places, uh, let's talk about D.C. for a little bit with the time we've got. Um, Let me start off by asking you, it seems as though the efforts on the part of the Republicans this week to get uh, some more money put into the PPP and uh, the other part of the CARES Act uh, hit a a firewall this week. Can you just kind of give us the update, uh, real-time scenario of where we are right now and what, what it looks like moving forward? Be happy to. Uh, and, yeah, I, I count this week as a lost week and a real tragedy that uh, the Democrats and, – and, look, I, I try not to be too terribly uh, harsh on the other party because I've got a lot of friends on that side of the aisle that I work closely with. But for the most part, they recognized that there was going to be uh, – I call it a train moving out of the station, a, a bill – that was going to be able to get out of Congress, possibly under unanimous consent, that would address the fact that we were about and now finally have exhausted all the money that we had appropriated for the Paycheck Protection Program. And the Democrats knew that we were going to be coming back for more money because of the popularity of that program. So what do they do? They start trying to figure out, all right, how can we load a bill that's going to move out of Congress with some stuff that we want on it? And frankly, we were all, uh, all all the Republicans were united in the fact that we wanted to put another two hundred fifty billion dollars into the Paycheck Protection Program fund so that we can continue to take care of small business in our state. Very popular program. Uh, But we ran into a roadblock. I say we, the Democrats in the Senate, basically said, no, if you can't give us more money for hospitals and more money for state and local governments, then uh, then we're not going to play. So they blocked it. So the earliest that we can do it now with that money having been depleted is at the beginning of this next week. And, Kim, I think it's going to happen. Now, the question is, is it going to have a lot of other junk tied to it, or are we going to stand our ground and say we're, we're going to spend another $250 billion of taxpayer money and we need to limit uh, the appropriation to just the program 
that we're trying to help, and that's the Paycheck Protection Program. Here's the deal. The the Small Business Administration, in 14 days, uh, doled out loans that, if you add them all up, would account for about 14 years worth of SBA activity. And they were able to do it in 14 days. That shows you how popular that program is. We're keeping a lot of people on the payroll. We're keeping a lot of people from having to go to the unemployment line uh, and and sit on their duff. Uh, and we've been able to give a whole lot of employers an opportunity to weather the storm here for several weeks so that on the other side of this coronavirus uh, phenomenon that we're dealing with, uh, they can kind of be uninterrupted other than the fact that their businesses have uh, had this uh, uh, hardship uh, placed on them. But to be able to keep these people on the payroll, we think, was a very important uh, endeavor on the part of the Congress. But now Democrats are going to try to play with that and see see what more they can uh, get uh, if we're going to move another bill. I had Senator Bozeman on a few weeks ago and, and uh, Congressman French Hill on a couple weeks before that. And one of the things that they both brought out was the uh, how much, uh, for lack of better uh, words, pork barrel spending was attached to this bill. And uh, the, the one thing that was disappointing was that in a time of crisis like this, when you're just trying to you know take care of the essential services, the amount that was added to it in order for you to get it through the, um, you know, to get it through and get it passed and get it out there. The, are you looking at that same thing as far as what's going on now or have, you know, have the Democrats uh, backed off of ha- adding so much uh, fat and so much pork to it? Uh, do you see it trimming down any at all? Well, I, I do. Uh, of course, I'm going to leave that to the Senate because they'll have the first bite at this apple. Uh, but, but let me tell you the difference between then and now. Back then, we knew we were in the throes of a terrible hardship, one of unprecedented proportions in the country. And we knew that there were going to be extreme hardships placed on the entire economy, and and nobody was going to be unaffected by it. So in that process, we crafted this two-plus trillion dollar bill. And frankly, uh, when, when you're dealing with that kind of money, and you know, Kim, I don't know very many people even the smartest people I know, I don't know can fully understand just how much $2 trillion is. Uh, But at the end of the day, we crafted the bill knowing that there were going to have to be some things in it that we don't want to have to vote for. But in order to be able to get this done in a timely way and start getting money out the door to the people truly hardship. We knew there was going to be some of that. So the Kennedy Center stuff, those kinds of things that ended up in the bill, you kind of have to accept the fact that on a bill of that proportion, you're going to have to uh, have – there are going to be some things in it that you're going to have to hold your nose to vote for. The difference, though, between then and now is a whole lot of that $2 trillion hasn't even gone out the door yet. So how can you decide today – what the true need is going to be, say, three months, six months from now, until you start seeing what the true effects of this phenomenon are, I think it is unwise and highly inappropriate for the Congress to be going back and start throwing hundreds of billions of dollars more before we know the full effect. We're not even sure when this thing is going to open back up. My hope is sooner than later. Uh, But uh, and and as an example, I'll give you one example. Uh, We've got one hundred and fifty billion dollars in the CARES package that is designed to go to state and local governments. Well, that money's not out the door yet. State of Arkansas is going to get a billion two hundred fifty million dollars, but it hasn't come to the state of Arkansas yet. But you still got Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer that are clamoring for more money, even though we haven't been able to move the money in the CARES package first. So I, I sign me up as somebody who believes that we shouldn't be doing this now until many weeks later when we know what the full effects are going to be of the economic hardship that has plagued our country. And it's just way too early to determine that right now. So here's what I say we do. 
Let's take care of the program that we know has already been depleted, the Paycheck Protection Program, that has helped thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses all across our country be able to keep their employees on the payroll. And if they do it right, the loans that they've been able to be granted become forgivable, i.e. become grants as opposed to loans. So let's let's go ahead and plus that account up now, and let's worry about the other stuff down the road when we have a little bit more clarity as to what the true hardship is going to be. But leave it to Democrats to be able to stand right in the middle of this thing and say, no, if you're going to get money for something you like, then we're going to get money for things that we like. And, and I say it's far too early to be putting more money into hospitals and state and local governments when we haven't even seen the full effect of the money that hasn't even gone out the door yet. This is kind of my summary of how I view it sitting here in Arkansas, watching what y'all are doing up in Arkansas, and tell me if it's a, a correct perspective. So obviously the, the COVID-19 came on us pretty quick. Some would say we knew about it sooner than others, and that's you know that'll always be an ongoing bait, who knew what, when. And set that argument to the side for just a second. The reality is it's come upon us, and so it wasn't only a uh, a health disaster, it was an economic disaster that was coming simultaneous for the perfect storm. And as a result of y'all realizing that there had to be things done on the medical front, you were having to do at the same time things on the financial front. So y'all put this CARES Act together over a period of, I'm not sure how long you actually spent putting it together. I heard that actually the bill was written in 24 hours once everything kind of gelled up. But while it is that you got the money appropriated, how that looks coming down to the state and the guidelines that come down with it, such as uh, banks being able to loan small business loans and knowing whether or not they're going to get caught in the middle and they may loan the money, but then the feds wouldn't give the money to them. That's where the banks have been really apprehensive. A lot of this is is kind of playing out day to day, hour by hour, as states adopt what you have done up there and put it into uh, put it into application at the state level. And that's that's why some of the delay, some of the confusion, some of the frustration, which is working itself out the further we go. But now that phase two or this other phase is about to come on, hopefully we'll have a lot of that worked out. So when you put more money in the existing program, we will have already worked some of these things out and it'll go smoother. Is that a, is that a fair 100,000 foot view characterization? Yeah, spot on. You know, you can appropriate the money, but then there are rules that have to be written uh, and and permissions granted, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, by uh, organizations like the Treasury Department. So, uh, and, and that's why it takes a while between the effective action of the Congress, which approves and votes on the statute that gets signed in law, and then so much of the decision making then rotates over to the bureaucratic institutions, and they wield a lot of power. So having to kind of go through that maze of rulemaking uh, and preparing uh, the country for what the different bureaucratic institutions, whether it's HUD or Treasury or the IRS, you name it, uh, uh, each one of those organizations have to take what we've approved in statute, what we voted on and was signed into law, and then apply the rules to it so that the people on the receiving end of it can understand the ramifications if they uh, get outside those rules. For example, on PPP, if a small businessman gets a loan and then he ends up spending that money for something entirely different than its intended purpose, it won't be forgiven. It'll, it'll still be a loan, and he'll have about two years to pay it, albeit at a small interest rate, but it won't be forgiven. If they stay within the boundaries of the, law, of, of the rules as prescribed by the bureaucratic institution, then it, it becomes forgivable. So all of that rulemaking and all of that, uh, all, all those permission granty, uh, grantings that happen by the bureaucrats uh, still takes time. You know, I talked a minute about a minute ago about the uh, billion and a quarter that's going to come to the state of Arkansas. Well, the money hasn't come, nor have the instructions on what does qualify as a, cor a coronavirus expense on behalf of a state and local government. Well, until Treasury publishes that information. It's very difficult for us to understand how that money is going to be apportioned out by the state 
and and who's going to get it and for what purpose? And you're talking so, about the Treasury at the you're talking about the Washington Treasury, not the Arkansas yeah, Treasury. Yeah. Okay. Federal federal Treasury. Federal. So they got to write some rules on, on what qualifies as an expense. For example, last night I got a call from the Municipal League and I got a call from the Benton County Judge and today text messaging from the Washington County Judge. Now these are three pretty sizable organizations wanting to, uh, for lack of a better term, I I hate to use the word lobby, but they're talking to me about, hey, in this upcoming next tranche of federal relief, keep us in mind. Well, as I told all of them, you know, it's hard for me to uh, pressure uh, the Congress, my colleagues in Congress or the president, the White House, uh, to do another tranche until we see what we've done so far and what impact it has had and whether or not there's even going to be a demonstrative need for a lot more money. Now, we know PPP is out of money, so I think we need to take care of that program. We need to deal with it. But some of these other programs, we got to wait and see. All right, tell you what, we're coming down to the last few minutes. Can you hang over at the bottom of the hour or you got to go? Sure. All right. Sure, I can hang. Okay, well, I'll get you on about uh, for about another 10 minutes. I've got uh, Cody Waits with the uh, – he's the Director of Office of Skill Developments Division, uh, Department of Commerce, which I think is going to play a critical role moving forward because with so many Arkansans out of work, and I think I heard this morning 22 million, 25 million uh, citizens nationwide, nationwide yeah. out of work, uh, I'm a big advocate along with others, you know, for uh, for uh, career tech and, and skill development kind of uh, – work opportunities. I, I I will advocate and lobby you that some of the money coming down, I wish could be directed toward that just so that we make sure that it is going where the jobs are needed for those skill sets. But here's a question. Uh, here's a, uh, a question from a listener wanted to know, will the public know when the next stimulus bill is in committee so citizens can have a say before it goes to the full house? So real quick, what's the process as far as when it's going to be uh, where the public can watch the debate for this next stimulus bill coming down? Well, it will originate uh, more than likely out of the Senate. Um, and, and, and yes, that's the short answer. Is yes, of course, it's going to be publicized when, when the Congress is back in <clears throat> session and negotiating the next round, should there be another round, then uh, what is being included in that round of legislation uh, will, of course, be published. It, it'll have to be. I mean, it's it's going to be completely transparent. Now, the timing with which it will happen is still, I, I would guess, up in the air. But it will be uh, subject to a debate, uh, and members of Congress will get the full text of the bill. We'll look at it before we vote, and I'm sure most of us will uh, inquire as to, from our constituents as to what they feel uh, but in the last CARES package, so much of it was being done by, in committee uh, and by committee staff particularly. Uh, it was at the 11th hour before we were able to see the text of the bill. But again, as I said earlier, knowing that we're in the early stages of a major crisis affecting our country, it just didn't give us the opportunity to fully vet uh, the issues completely before we were able to uh, to vote on it. Now, some of this may indeed go by unanimous consent, meaning that it won't go through the normal committee process with full transparency. Instead, we'll just come to a floor vote in the Senate under UC and then moved over to the House and ask the House to consider it by UC. But if you remember the last time, Kim, we had a member from Kentucky that objected to the unanimous consent request uh, and only because there was a quorum established of people like myself who had gone to Washington for the purposes of being there physically for the vote uh, were, were we able to overcome the objection by uh, the gentleman from Kentucky and able to get the uh, issue passed. Okay, It'll let be me, different the next let, time. It'll be different the next time around. All right. Well, hang on through the bottom of the hour. Let me get a couple things in real quick before we have to go to a break. I want to thank Everett Buick GMC as a sponsor of the program. Baxley Pinfield Mountie Realtors down Saline County. Appreciate them and Edwards Food Stores in Central Arkansas. Remember, you can go up to it's the Kim Hammer Show. Spell out the word the KimHammerShow.com. Get a lot of good information up there. Uh, Congressman, when we come back, I want to talk about the money coming down to city, county, local, and how that's going to look and how that uh, is intended to be spent. 
and also uh, want to get your input about the responsibility that China holds in this and then uh, talk about the farmers and some of the concerns that they're putting out as well. This is the Kim Hammer Show. We'll be back in a couple minutes. So I don't know if you saw this, but there was just this big study about anxiety among us. Really interesting in this study about what can keep us up at night. One of the top stressors out of all the things to worry about is paying for health care. A huge majority of us say we're worried about that. It's totally understandable, but there's an affordable alternative to health insurance. It's MediShare. It's a Christian health care sharing ministry, and it has worked beautifully for more than 25 years. And not only do people save lots of money, they get access to a huge network of doctors. They get to take advantage of 24-7 live access online where they can talk to a doctor and even get prescriptions. And of course, there is the savings. With MediShare, the typical family saves $500 a month. That can help you sleep easier, too. There's a lot to love about it. No wonder it's grown so much. Here is the number to find out more. Call 855-BIBLE-11. That's 855-B-I-B-L-E-11. 855-BIBLE-11. Have a great weekend. We'll get back together. 6 a.m. Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show. Glad that you're joining us. I always want to say thank you to our sponsors. Make this show possible. That's Everett Buick GMC down there in Saline County. You can shop them online or go down there and see them at uh, I-30 and uh, Alcoa Road, uh, Baxley, Penfield, Mowdy, taking care of all your real estate needs here in central Arkansas, whether it's commercial, residential, uh, rental. If you need uh, anything rental, either along the commercial or residential line, they can help take care of you down there. And then Edwards Food Stores, always appreciative of them. They're here in central Arkansas and over in east Arkansas. Remember that you can go up to our, uh, our website that we've got launched now. It's thekimhammershow.com. Keep a lot of valuable information, update information, get a lot of it from uh, uh, from the congressmen and from the senators and from just things that we are picking up around here locally. Uh, there's even a spiritual icon that you can click on because I put a daily devotion on there that you can watch. They're usually around five, six minutes long or uh, lately on Sunday, which I'll be tomorrow at noon uh, here on 101.1 or Facebook Live uh, because we are practicing social distancing the church I pastor, which is Saline Baptist Church down community called Tull, just out bent, outside of Benton there. We're doing our services live on the radio, so you can go up there and uh, click on to those and watch those if you want to. And so just a lot of good stuff, a lot of good information for you to be able to uh, pick up on. And we just appreciate you listening to the Kim Hammer Show. We've got Congressman Walmack, who's going to be with us for about 10 more minutes. And then we're going to get Cody Waits, who's the director for Office of Skills Development Division out of the Department of Commerce on, and we're going to talk about some skilled labor and uh, the essential need for that in the state today as well as in the nation. Uh, let's do this, uh, Congressman Walmack. Let me let me take you back to a topic you hit on a second ago. You talked about getting phone call and texts from your mayors and from your county judges up there. A good part of this $1.2 billion or a portion of it coming down to the state of Arkansas is intended to get its way to city, county, and local, what we call uh, which would be your towns and be your uh, rural areas, uh, but also would involve your counties. Can you talk about what the intent in the CARES Act was for how that money coming down to the state is supposed to be utilized once we get it figured out here in the state, how it's supposed to be pushed out? Sure. Now, I wasn't included in the discussions that led to that money going into the bill but let me tell you what my interpretation is, because in the statute, in the bill itself, it says for coronavirus-related expenses, 
uh, as of the date when the bill was enacted and through uh, the rest of this calendar year, all the way through December of 20. And, uh, and, and so uh, what Treasury's got to do now is they've got to come back and write the rules on what does constitute a coronavirus expense. For example, if, you, if, if you're a city or you're a county, and your sales tax collection, say in the previous in the trailing twelve months, were X, and now it's X minus. Then, to me, you've suffered economic hardship as a county or a city uh, that can easily, in my opinion, be traced back to the fact that people uh, are sheltering in place, not out shopping, th- those kinds of things. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, I. I think we've got to be able to see what the receipts are going to look like here for the ensuing next couple of months, beginning in mid-May, because it's all about 45 days late, uh, and then uh, for the ensuing next two or three months to be able to determine what that economic hardship is. Uh, To me, that qualifies. But will Treasury allow that to be a qualifier? So back to the point, $150 billion in the bill, uh, it was – uh, the, the money was supposed to go to population centers of greater than 500,000. Now, Kim, you and I both know we don't have any place in the state of Arkansas that qualifies. We, the, the largest county in the state, I guess Pulaski County, is probably, what, around 400,000 people. I know Benton County is not 500,000. Washington County is not 500,000. We don't have any cities over 500,000. So w- when when that happens, when we have no – uh, qualified city or, or county uh, at 500000 or more, then, then the state of Arkansas gets a consolidated amount of a, of a billion, $250 million. That money has not come to the state yet. So when the rules are written, it is my belief that after the state of Arkansas kind of uh, covers its expenses, you know, the PPE they bought, uh, some of those kinds of things, that uh, certainly not a billion, two hundred fifty million dollars worth of expense. I would think that the governor and the legislature uh, would deem cities and counties to get some uh, proportionate share of the remaining money. Now, what that's going to look like, I don't know. And I'm only speaking here, kind of philosophically about it. So, uh, how that's going to be apportioned out is largely going to be up to the governor and the state uh, legislature. But there's a billion two hundred fifty million dollars that's going to be coming to the state, and the rules uh, with which what qualifies as an expense will be uh, very important in discerning how that money should be allocated. And there is some apprehension, I think, with the state level that uh, we're kind of in that in that uh, transition time where we're waiting for the direction to come out of D.C. Because the last thing we want to do is spend money, and then a year later or two years later get audited by the feds and, you know, have to pay money back or, or just have that unpleasant experience in the press. And so, you know, sooner those things can come down, but I, I do think that there's a spirit of attitude in the state that we recognize that uh, cities and, and counties are experiencing a hit through this, just like the state agencies are. I'm going to throw this out there in November, there's a tax that's going to be on the books or that's going to be up on the ballot uh, regarding funding highway departments uh, so when you talk about the the negative impact, uh, you know this isn't going to be resolved in the next month. It could have residual effects way past November, even if we get the COVID nineteen under control. Uh, there's still going to be some spinoff because our economy is not going to be rebooted to the full effect it was when it shut down. Um, let me ask you a question: two trillion dollars this round. That's a as you said, just a heck of a lot of money. That's hard for any of us to wrap our minds around. How do you justify as a congressman or how do you justify as a senator taking us that far into debt with knowing that we already had a accumulating debt on top of this? What was going on in the mines up there in, in D.C.? Was it like, well, we got to do it this or it's going to be done to us this or help me understand how it is that you could saddle two trillion dollars worth of debt on us as citizens? Well, we could argue about whether or not uh, that's the right number, whether it should be two trillion or two and a half trillion or one trillion. I mean, but that that ship is sailed, so that's not really um, in play right now. But I, I guess the short answer to your question, Kim, is 
looking at the alternative. If you don't do something, then uh, the economic hardship that is sure to follow, i.e., people just getting laid off with nowhere to go, no ability to plus up the um, unemployment. And, and Arkansas was in good shape, but it was uh, that, that was going to be short-lived. It, it was going to turn on us. So it, it's clearly down to a, 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 you know, basically a decision as to doing something or doing nothing. And to me, the consequences of doing nothing were not only going to have economic calamity for the state of Arkansas and for the rest of the country, but likely would have exacerbated the situation with regard to the public health crisis that we were in. So I felt like we had to do something. Didn't have many options. We had to take the bill that came out of the Senate. And even though it had some things in it that I didn't really care for, and it did spend more money than I thought we should have committed, it wasn't an opportunity for me to be able to say, well, let's go back to the drawing board and let's hammer out something that we could all uh, come to terms with. That was about, you know, because we're having to take what the Senate's doing, that was about the, the limit of our, uh, of our choices at the time. So it's kind of a take it or leave it situation. I promise you in the next round, as I've already said in a previous segment, the next round is going to be looked at wholly differently, completely differently. Now, we know Paycheck Protection Program has been widely popular and uh, clearly out of money. So we'll plus that one up. But the question is, what more will we do? And I say it's way too premature to try to figure out how much more money we can spend or how much more money we can go into debt for future generations to pay uh, without having uh, knowledge of what the full hardship is. Well, I know our unemployment fund had $875 million. It was pretty healthy uh, compared to where we were back in 2008. And even that is going to be strained over this deal, including with what's being done through the PPE. And so when I ask you that question, I do believe there's a sound reasoning. Uh, you know, you had a choice of do nothing and watch it collapse or try to shore something into it in order to get us past this time and uh, you know, hopefully by the middle of summer to to the latter part of the year when we go into Christmas, we can see our economy engine pick back up. And, uh, you know, the only thing I would ask is that, you know, as it picked back up, that it would be applied back toward that to start bringing that back down, having, you know, helped us through this time. Let me ask you two other quick questions. i got to get to my next guest. How responsible is China in this? I was listening to a show yesterday, and this could be just – you know, hype, it could be factual, it could be wishful thinking, whatever. But, you know, there's a there's an attitude out there about a pound of flesh out of China uh, because it appears or there's investigation that maybe this did come out of that lab over there. Senator Cotton talked about this uh, early on. What is the temperament, what is the attitude uh, as far as up in D.C. about holding China accountable to some degree uh, for their role in, in this uh, China virus? Well, first of all, we have a mechanism because we owe them a lot of money. I mean, we, they, 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 they have a—I don't know what the last number I heard was about a trillion and a half dollars uh, that you know that they hold of our debt. So um, that, there's one mechanism there that uh, we can turn to in the event that uh, we hold them economically responsible. Look, it didn't make any difference where it originated, whether it was way south of Wuhan or it doesn't make any difference. The fact is. They misrepresented and hid from the public, hid from the WHO, hid from everybody uh, the true effects of coronavirus. So this COVID-19 situation uh, manifested itself in ways that early on uh, we didn't have the we didn't have the up to date uh, information. And, uh, and and they were very untruthful with us. So and I'm trying to guard my words carefully because I try not to speak ill of too many foreign countries, but clearly in this case, China does hold some culpability in what's happened around the world. So yeah, do I think they've got uh, uh, blood on their hands, so to speak? Yes, I do. And I think they should be held accountable. And just what that will look like uh, will uh, bring up another robust discussion in Congress. And, uh, and I'll be right there in the middle of it, trying to do our part to make sure that China doesn't come through this unscathed. All right. Let me uh, let me close out, but just saying, I, I think as Arkansans, we're blessed to have the delegation representing us in Arkansas that we do. We've got Senator Cotton, Senator Bozeman, and, uh, you know, they represent us well. And then we've got the four con congressmen, uh, Westerman, uh, Crawford, yourself, and then 
uh, French Hill, which French Hill, if I remember right, or it was brought to my attention, he just got a pretty distinguished appointment in D.C. this past week, didn't he? Yeah. In the coronavirus legislation, there's an oversight committee uh, that involves members of Congress and this, the leader of our party, Kevin McCarthy, had a vote. You know, he had a he had a designee. And yesterday he announced that it would be French Hill could not have made a better choice. French is a subject matter expert on all things financial. He's got his background in Treasury under the Bush administration, previous Bush administration. And uh, and, and he knows what he's talking about. So is a is a great credit to the state of Arkansas that Leader McCarthy uh, when he had a when he had a selection to make that he looked to Arkansas first and he picked my friend French Hill. I, I, I'm on the steering committee of the U.S. House in, in the Republican side, and we are the people that populate the committees. and And I I got to tell you, the the day that I had the privilege of nominating French for financial services and getting him selected to that committee uh, was a big day for our state. It's one of the A committees. It's something that um, our state uh, definitely benefits from. And the fact that French has been tapped for this service on the oversight committee, I think, is a, a feather in his cap, a credit to his ability. And, uh, and, and I'm very, very proud that he was given that uh, distinction. Very good. Well, we're proud of all of y'all, the job you're doing. And uh, I'm just especially proud you honor the show by taking some time out on a beautiful Saturday to join us here. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back on. That's been Steve Walmack. Congressman for the 3rd Congressional District here in the state of Arkansas up in northwest Arkansas that's been on the Kim Hammer Show today. And, uh, Congressman, appreciate you being on. Before we go to our next uh, guest, let me just uh, point out our sponsors for the show. We've got Everett Buick GMC down there in Saline County. Shop them online or shop them there. Uh, social distancing, but still available for you to go down and take a look at all the great deals they got on vehicles going on right now. If you need real estate anywhere in central Arkansas, Baxley, Penfield, Mowdy, uh, based out of Saline County, but they cover a good portion of central Arkansas. They can help you on residential or on commercial if you're looking to buy or to sell. And if you're looking to rent, they've got an uh, excellent rental division down there that deals also with commercial and residential. Uh, so just give Baxley Pinfield Mouty a call down there. Tell them you heard them on the Kim Hammer Show, and they'll take care of you. Then Edwards Food Stores here in central Arkansas over in east Arkansas. Appreciate them very much and the great job they do. They have been excellent when it comes to being involved in the in the uh, supply line of groceries. Always kept their stores well stocked, clean, and they haven't been doing any price gouging or any of that kind of crap. And uh, they've just done a great job. So I encourage you just to support them as well. All right. Now, to finish out the hour, we have on Cody Waits, uh, who is the Director of Office of Skills Development Division under the Department of Commerce. Cody, thank you for being on the show today. Are you there? I am. Good afternoon, Kim, and thank you. Um, it's always uh, uh, nice to hear the conversation with Congressman Womack. Um, I had a, I had the privilege of sitting down with him at his office in D.C. in the beginning of February, and and he's always gracious with his time and always provides a lot of information. So, listening to the to the interaction between you two gentlemen recent, you know, over the last forty five minutes or so has been really informative. Well, he cut in some of your time, and I'll get you back, and I apologize for that, but I want to take advantage of the congressman while I had him because he's, you know, back and forth to D.C., but you may have heard Absolutely. one of the things that, you know, that I'm advocating for, I would advocate for in the CARES Act or anything else that's coming down uh, is some of the federal funding that could help with our skilled labor, uh, such as in the, uh, you know, in, in the uh, career technical uh, side of education, you know, people looking for a skill set type job. Uh, maybe not maybe not interested in going to college or maybe they're wanting to retrain, especially with the high unemployment rate. Uh, some people are probably going to be looking for new places of employment, maybe utilizing different skills. So in your title as Director of Office of Skill Development Division, and now you're under uh, Secretary Mike Preston and the Department of Commerce, just talk about that for a minute, how that looks moving forward with us having such a high unemployment rate in the state right now, and how do you see all this shaking out, especially with – uh, you've got apprenticeship programs and talk about that for just a minute. Sure. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, um, Congressman Womack hit on something too, that I kind of jotted down was, you know, we're still waiting on some guidance from treasury as to, you know, a, a, some of the ways in which those funds can be spent. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we're trying to plan because as you mentioned, right. I mean, there's a lot of individuals out there who are, who are, you know, being laid off, being furloughed, going to be unemployed, um, or already are so, and so how do we provide them some sort of access to training 
um, you know, during this time, it, should they be looking for other opportunities, right? So, I mean, these individuals are, are at the very least, if not hired back by their current employer, they're going to have to retrain and redeploy back into the back into the workforce, whether that's in a in a similar type skill set position that they have now, or perhaps it's something different. You know, so we're thinking strategically around how can we provide individuals that have lost the, you know their jobs due to this you know crisis. Um, the opportunity to receive training, whether that's uh, at no cost to the individual um, in the IT sector, or perhaps there's some some things we can do within uh, manufacturing or healthcare, um, or even education, right? You know, and, and how that's been impacted over the last few months with all of this. So, you know, we're starting to think creatively around, you know, if some of this 1.25 billion, you know, that Congressman Womack was speaking to, is able to be utilized on workforce development, workforce training. How could we use that money to, to most efficiently deploy some services to the people that need it most, which are those individuals who have been laid off? And, you know, and then as you look to, you know, the career and technical education aspect of it all, you know, as you assisted us, you know, in, in sponsoring the legislation that we passed during the last legislative session, which was Act 179, you know, transferring to our new funding formula for career, you know, technical education and secondary career centers across the state. You know, we, we've all, we've always known that we need more money for that for that fund, and, and we know there's probably some restrictions around budget gaps and things of that nature. But you know, there's going to be some shortages of equipment, right? And so, how do we how do we maybe perhaps utilize some of that funding to to help purchase equipment for some of these workforce training centers? You know, that's always a big need is ensuring that our students have access to to, to tier one quality type programs with the state of the art equipment in them. And so, you know, I think once we get some guidance in terms of how a lot of this funding can be used. While we're already thinking ahead as to how we can do it, um, you know, once we get some some more guidance, we'll actually be able to start putting some things in play, um, and hopefully start putting it in action so that our our young individuals, our high school students, our K twelve, our adult learners, and those individuals who are you know currently furloughed or unemployed um, can have access to to quality training and, and retrain and redeploy back into the workforce at the appropriate time. Talk about apprenticeships. So uh, I know you have them for yeah. the high school population. You have them for the adult. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. some people look upon them as the best thing since sliced bread. Some are maybe a little apprehensive backing away from them. Clear up some right. of the cloudiness around when you talk about apprenticeship, what exactly does that look like? Well, um, apprenticeships, if you think about just, you know, in general, um, apprenticeship is a combination of, of on-the-job training and, and classroom instruction. A lot of times you'll hear Department of Labor and others call it RTI, which is Related Technical Instruction. And typically an apprenticeship, you know, if you think about it in terms of electric electricians and plumbers, right? It's a four-year apprenticeship. It's um, eight thousand hours of on-the-job training. You know, so two thousand hours a year and one hundred forty-four hours of classroom instruction a year. Um, but you know, over the last, especially the last four years, we've seen a lot of apprenticeships grow in in what they call kind of non-traditional uh, fields, which is not related to construction for the most part. So we've seen apprenticeships expand in, in manufacturing. So whether that's uh, operators or industrial maintenance or robotics technicians, um, so we have apprenticeships in manufacturing, healthcare, IT. We've seen a huge growth and ramp up in IT apprenticeships. We actually partner with a group called the Arkansas Center for Data Sciences, and um, you know we're tasked with you know developing a, a, a you know a lot of individuals um, with skills that can be. Um, software developers or data scientists and data analytics, uh, cybersecurity professionals. And so, you know, we've we've already expanded. We've, we've enrolled probably 100 apprentices in the last six months um, in, in IT apprenticeships. But, you know, when Governor Hutchinson took office, you know, back in 15, we only had about 3,200 apprentices in the state of Arkansas. Now we're up to over 6,500 apprentices in Arkansas, and a large number of those are now expanding into those other areas like I talked about. Um, you know, you had primarily about 82, you know, programs across the state. Now we're up to 140 programs across the state in terms of apprenticeship. So a lot of growth, you know, there's a lot of factors, you know, uh, that employers like to see, you know, like for every dollar invested in apprenticeship, is there, there's a dollar 47 return on that investment, you know, in apprenticeships. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, facts and stats out there that show that, you know, apprentices, um, stay with an employer uh, much longer than they do from somebody that did not go through an apprenticeship. Um, you know, there's there's things that show, you know, an average apprentice after their first year of finishing an apprenticeship, you know, makes $70,000 a year on average. You know, those are those are great things to, to look at from a t- statistical standpoint. And they come out of these things with no college debt, right? So it's not like you have to go to college for this thing. Most of the time, the employers are, are footing the bill for the for the technical instruction that a lot of times is either done 
by a, by a for-profit apprenticeship school or at a two-year community college. So not only is the individual getting this training, they're actually earning a wage, um, progressively increasing as they go through the lifetime of the apprenticeships, whether that's a one-year, a two-year, or a four-year apprenticeship. Um, those people come out and, and, and they're stronger um, than perhaps some of the individuals that may be going to a two-year or four-year university for a general education type deal. So when do, as far, I, I know there's been an effort in the last couple of years for us to try to start at the lower grade level, somewhere in the, you know, in the middle school to the junior high, as far as identifying uh, areas that, that students may have an interest in working in so that we could kind of get them into a career path. Now, we're not trying to do anything like China or communist countries where, you know, you <laughs> no. walk in at fifth grade and say, you're going to be a welder, doesn't matter what. That's not the intent right. of it. So kind of put that conspiracy theory out of your head here, uh, not talking to you, but put that conspiracy theory out of your head. But it is a known fact that not every student that graduates high school is going to go on to a four-year college and do a degree in something because that's not where their interest lies. So as far as what's going on to help students identify earlier what their interest levels might be so they could start to get prepared to get into an apprentice uh, program, how is the landscape now? What's it look like now as far as where that begins and how it carries through high schools? Uh, you're certainly right. I mean, so we've, we've been talking a lot, you know, over the last few years around, we have to, we have to start attracting and interesting, getting students interested into other occupations, you know, at a much earlier age, you know, we've, we've actually partnered with a couple of groups. Um, one of them is called Talo. We're in the process of trying to finish up a, a, a pro partnership with them, which is a kind of a LinkedIn for, for high school students, middle school, school students, where uh, they develop a profile. Um, you know, companies can have access to this information. They actually start doing outreach um, to individuals while they're in high school, right? So, for an example, um, say you're a high school student and you are in robotics and you, took, you participated in VEX Robotics, um, FIRST Robotics, wherever the case may be, and you, you have a passion to be an engineer, right? So you can fill out this, this kind of profile. So again, think LinkedIn, but for high school students on Tallow, um, where you show all the things that you've done, all the projects and competitions you've competed in, what your interest is. If you're interested in going into an apprenticeship or a two-year or four-year university, if you want to become an engineer, companies can then you know, license from Tallow to have access to all this talent. So say they want to look in Saline County, say there's a company in Saline County, or perhaps it's just a company in Arkansas that says, I know there's a there's a great program in Saline County, for example. How do I find access? So they can actually select kind of a range where I'm looking for 16 to, to 20 year old individuals um, who show an interest in engineering and have robotics experience, and I want to know within the, a 35 mile radius of how many people that is. So they could do all that, and then it would populate every student within that range that meets kind of that criteria that they could select, whether that's female, male, right, whatever the case may be. And so um, they can then actually reach out to that individual and um, kind of like a direct message like you would on Facebook or LinkedIn or anything else to say, hey, you know, I, I am with X and X company, right? And we have engineering positions, you know, that, that yes, they require a four-year degree or no, they don't. Or here's the things. Did you know about us? And are you familiar with us? We have internship opportunities. We have apprenticeship opportunities. And so they can actually start to develop whether that's a relationship or just a conversation with a young student you know, whether they're 16, 17, 18 years old, uh, to try to attract them and get them to know the company on a, on a more in-depth level so the student can make a, you know, informed decision as to, you know, wow, so I didn't realize all these companies in this area, you know, hired engineering, you know, professionals or needed robotics technicians. And, and since my background fits that, then, then they can kind of attract them that way. That's, that's one unique thing that we're doing to try to assist students and companies because companies are trying to find this talent too. So trying to think creatively around how companies can get access to that talent pipeline and how students can better understand and know what opportunities exist in their local communities or whether that's regional or statewide. Um, that's one avenue that we're taking. All right. Tell you what, we're down to the last minute. I promise I'll have you back on, but let's do this uh, to those that are listening. Cody, if you'll send me some links where I can get uh, people to you quicker uh, to get more information sure. about these things, just text it to me and I'll get it up on my website. That's the Kim Hammer Show website, kimhammershow.com. I'll get that connected. That's Cody Waits, Director of Office of Skill Development Divisions, Department of Commerce that's been on talking about apprenticeship, skill labor. We also had Steve Walmack, uh, Congressman for the 3rd Congressional District, 
And I want to thank our sponsors, Everett Buick GMC, Baxley Penfield Mowdy, Edward Food Stores, and I'll be back on the air tomorrow at noon uh, bringing a message of hope for you if you want to tune in at this time. This is the Kim Hammer Show. Have a great day. 101.1 FM, The Answer, KDXE FM, Kamek Village, Little Rock, a Salem Media Group station. 101.1 FM, The Answer.